Some uh, other announcements coming up this week. Uh, the right, this is a fairly light week, but some special things going on. The ladies' Bible study is Tuesday at 6.30. Thursday at 6.30, the adults will be having their Maundy Thursday service. That will be downstairs. And then the Olympians will be upstairs. We are doing a Nerf battle. And the teens will be next door doing whatever the teens do. What, is there anything special, Dayton? Oh, it's a surprise. Okay. If you're a teen, you have to come and find out what's going on. We'll do it that way. How's that sound? Uh, April events coming up. Easter Sunday, we have some special uh, things going on on the Sunday service. 15th is the ladies' brunch at 10 a.m. And then the annual business meeting will be the following Sunday. Uh, immediately following the service, we will have our business meeting and our desire would be that that would go very quickly, smoothly. If you have any questions about what's going on, we are voting on one situation, uh, and that has been, I believe, there are some slips still out there, so you can see how we would like to change our Constitution slightly. So uh, on the 22nd, the elders and deacons will begin together and praying and fellowshipping together. Uh, I would encourage you again to be praying for the leadership of the church. We want to lead the church in the direction that God wants us to go. And uh, the only way we can know, do that is by knowing God and, and uh, him interceding, uh, you interceding on our behalf to follow through on that. On the 30th is our fifth Sunday fellowship, and that will take place immediately following uh, the service. Again, a reminder, our annual business meeting is April 16th, so if you don't have it on your calendar already, I would encourage you, if you remember, to make sure you have that and get that taken care of. I already have mentioned that the Easter cards, uh, for those who are not able to attend, would encourage you to sign up on that. And then, after the service, I don't know that I have to encourage you, but many of you uh, do uh, spend some time with the refreshments, fellowshipping, catching up with one another, uh, and encouraging one another. And uh, then Sunday school will take place at 11.55, uh, continuing on in the book of James. Is that correct? Yes. And then for our scripture reading this morning, uh, actually I'm going to do, uh, put this together in a little bit different fashion, so hopefully you will uh, be able to understand it as I go through. But in Zechariah, in the Old Testament, chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold your king is coming to you. Right, uh, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then we go into the New Testament and we go over to the book of John, John chapter 12, verse 12. It says, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took, palm, or took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. I like how scripture is, I think Bush said the word homogenous. What you find in the New Testament will help you understand what's, or excuse me, in the Old Testament will help you understand what's going on in the New Testament and how many years before Jesus set foot on earth, this prophecy was take, took place. And we have a great God who puts this all together. He knits it all together. And that is the God that we serve. We have the opportunity of interacting with. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are magnificent. You are higher than we can imagine, wiser than we could ever con have a concep conception of. And yet, God, you desire to work in our hearts and our lives. In the lives of your children, you desire to work, to orchestrate, to guide, to direct, encourage, and even at times to discipline or chastise us. Father, we thank you that you love us with a love that is greater than anything we've ever comprehended. And so we've come before you this morning, humbly, asking you to guide and direct in this service this morning. May the words that we speak, the songs that we sing, the attitudes that we betray, uh, display may not betray you. We thank you, Father, for the way in which you have led and guided in this church 
and in this congregation. We thank you for the ways in which you have helped us through difficult times, and you have encouraged us through the good times. We thank you for that. We come again humbly before you, asking for your wisdom, your guidance. We pray that you would help us to take your word this morning, plant it deep into our hearts, but then, Father, that it would take root and produce fruit, that we might magnify and glorify you in a very real way. We thank you for those who are here this morning and the opportunity we have of gathering together freely. I can't help but think of those who gather together in secret, in darkness, perhaps in cold, not able to open Scripture because they don't dare to carry that Scripture with them. And Father, we have the opportunity of very openly carrying our Scriptures, coming before you, gathering together, fellowshipping publicly in a way that we so often uh, don't think about. Father, I pray that we would continue to pray for those who are persecuted, who are, who are in difficult times. I pray that we could be uh, that light that helps others in this community to understand the hope that is found in only in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for our community here. Pray that we would have wisdom, that we would be creative in how we are able to present the gospel very clearly, very openly, and that there would be some results, great results, as a result of our investment of time and energy. Lord, we think of those who are not able to be here this morning, whether traveling or set aside by sickness. We pray that you would, in your very special way, draw them to yourself, minister to them in a way that only you can, and that they would be assured of your presence, of your desire to continue to work in their lives. We thank you for those that represent the Lord Jesus Christ around the world, our fellow bro brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you for our missionaries who are establishing, helping to establish your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you would be with them, encouraging them, strengthening them. Father, we know that sometimes missionaries get very lonely, feel like they're out there alone. And we pray, again, that we would be prayer warriors, sustaining them, holding them up before you, that they might be encouraged through your Spirit. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity of being together. May we very carefully consider our ways as we dig into your Word, and then, as I've already prayed, that we would then display the fruit. Help us not to be just hearers, but doers of your Word. And above all, we want you to be honored, glorified, and magnified as a result of our time here together. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
again, I haven't been up here in like a month. It feels weird. Hi, my name is Pastor Doug, if any of you forgot. No, I'm not just joking. So, uh, I totally forgot that today for some reason is Palm Sunday. So I did not prepare a message about Palm Sunday. I know, I know. Uh, this is the last Sunday I'll be preaching here. Ah, just joking. Um, I had been, uh, I'd been praying about what Lord would have me preach on next. And so uh, I didn't know if I was, uh, wanted to do a really long series. Uh, and fortunately, I decided to do one. Um, and so we're going to be in the book of Genesis. If you don't know where that is in your Bible, it's the first one, uh, which is what Genesis means. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, um, that is where we will begin uh, in just a few minutes. So uh, it's rather fitting for Palm Sunday, I think, to talk about Genesis, as Genesis is the basis for our Lord Jesus Christ anyway. Um, so, and just the history of the church and the Israelites and of all creation. So before we get into our very long passage that we're going to read today, which will be two verses, um, I, I would like to talk about the theme and a couple different things first. So our theme... Uh, as a story of God's creation of the world and humanity, the fall of humanity into sin, God's plan to redeem and restore humanity uh, through, of course, his chosen people. So the book of Genesis is about the origins of the world. It's about the origins of humanity. Uh, it's, God's, it's about God's chosen people. It sets the stage, literally, for the rest of the Bible by establishing key themes such as sin, faith, and covenant. It also introduces important uh, characters, such as, of course, Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, whose stories help to illustrate these themes. And they help us to provide uh, examples of faith, of obedience, and of repentance. Ultimately, the theme of Genesis uh, is about God's sovereignty. Uh, it's about his love and his plan of reconciliation for humanity. Um, of course, that reconciliation for humanity is uh, to himself through, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, who on Palm Sunday, no, just joking, uh, but yeah, but uh, who on Palm Sunday entered in, of course, uh, to be slaughtered on our behalf. <clears throat> the context, there's a few different uh, pieces of context I'd like to go over. Of course, the context of Genesis can be understood on, on multiple levels. Uh, it includes historical, literary, theological contexts. Uh, speaking of historical, Genesis was written by, of course, Moses. He lived during the second millennium B.C., and uh, Genesis reflects the cultural, historical background of, of those that lived in the ancient Near East. Genesis was likely written to explain the origins of the world and of the Israelite people, to provide a theological foundation for the identity and relationship that people are supposed to have with God. Genesis is therefore seen as a foundational book, of course, for the Bible, providing important context for understanding the rest of Scripture. It also helps us understand the nature of God and his relationship with humans. Its historical and cultural context also sheds light on the social and religious uh, practices of the time, helps us to better understand the challenges um, uh, and triumphs uh, that uh, the people of God went through, uh, of course, in history. Um, Genesis is the first book of the Pentateuch, or what we, uh, we know as the Torah, uh, the Pentateuch uh, being the first five books of the Old Testament. The Torah really uh, is about the, uh, is the entire Old Testament. Uh, the, the Jews do not believe that there's a New Testament, so they wouldn't even refer to it as the Old Testament. They would only refer to it as the Torah. And if they were specifically speaking of the books of Moses, they would say the Pentateuch. So Genesis is part of the larger biblical narrative of God's redemptive plan for humanity. It introduces, of course, again, these key theological themes such as the nature of God, sin, faith, covenant. It lays the foundation uh, for these throughout the rest of the Bible. Um, Genesis also anticipates, it foreshadows the coming of Jesus Christ, who is ultimately the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. So overall, the context of Genesis is multifaceted. It encompasses both historical and theological dimensions it reflects the cultural and literary backgrounds uh, of the ancient Near East while also conveying important theological themes. Um, these are relevant not only to the readers that first read the words of Moses, but also to us, of course, today. Um, 
Just uh, I like outline, so historical outline. We have the creation, sin, history of the nations, which takes place Genesis 1 all the way through Genesis 11. The life of Abraham starts in, in chapter 12. That goes through chapters 25. And then we have the lives of Isaac and Jacob, who, of course, take over the, Israel, or the Israelite people, uh, of course, named after uh, Jacob, who re, is renamed to Israel. But that's 25 through 36. And then the lives of Joseph and his brothers uh, up and through Egypt is uh, chapters 37 through 50. So if you like outlines, uh, there's one for you. Uh, but there's the theological outline as well that kind of follows that uh, outline that I just showed, the historical outline. We have creation, then we have the patriarchs, we have the covenant, and then, of course, redemption. Creation, of course, Genesis begins with the story of God, how he created the world and everything in it, including humanity. The section includes the stories uh, of, Aber, or of Adam and Eve and the consequences of their disobedience and how that affects us today. The patriarchs, this middle section of Genesis focuses on the stories of the patriarchs, including Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. These narratives highlight some, uh, or yeah, these highlights, uh, these narratives highlight themes of faith, obedience, um, and God's providential care for his people, as well as the challenges and struggles that they faced in their journeys. We get the idea of covenant. Covenant throughout Genesis, God establishes covenants with his people promises uh, to bless and protect them if they remain faithful to him. These covenants are a central aspect of the book um, and its theological message. It anticipates the covenant relationship between between God and his people throughout the entire rest of the Old Testament and even carries on into the New. Redemption, the final section of Genesis, focuses on the story of Joseph and his family's migration to Egypt. It sets the stage for Exodus and for the rest of the biblical narrative section highlights the theme of God's redemptive plan for his people and anticipates the ultimate fulfillment of that plan, of course, through Jesus Christ. So, before we read our long-awaited verses, uh, I'd like to pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here, gathering us together as a family. Father, we ask as we now get into your word and, and read the verses that you have written down for us, I ask that it would just adhere to our hearts and adhere to our minds, Father God. It would change the way that we live, that we would want to honor you and love you with our lives, uh, and that we would be the servants that you have called us to be. So Lord, just bless our time together. Bless the words that uh, I speak. Let it be of you and not of myself. And so again, just thank you. We want to praise you and honor you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, Genesis 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. <clears throat> and that's it. Uh, just joking. The first two verses, there's a ton to unpack. Um, I almost did just Genesis 1-1, uh, which is, I might just redo it again next week, but there's just a lot course, the first point I'd like to bring out is that God is the beginning. He is the beginning and he is the end. Genesis 1-1 reveals that God, that he is the ultimate beginning of all things. He does not have a beginning. He is not created. He is the one that does the creating. He is the one who existed before everything else. He is the one that brought forth the universe and all things that are in it. This verse uh, implies that God is the end goal as well. He's the ultimate purpose and destination of creation. We can find comfort and hope in knowing that God is the source and sustainer of absolutely everything. Our ultimate purpose is, of course, to have a relationship with Him. And that is the purpose that He has for us. The first words of the Bible reveal that God is the creator of all things. This means that He is not simply a part of the created world. Rather, he is the one who made everything that exists. This emphasizes God's sovereignty and power over all of creation. As we see in the opening uh, verses here, uh, sorry, my computer's acting up. Okay. Um, the Bible revealed, of course, that God is the creator. Um, this emphasizes God's sovereignty and power over all creation. 
as we see in the opening chapter of Genesis, God spoke absolutely everything into existence. Just the Word of God has the power, all power. Uh, it had the power to create humanity, and of course, He did so in His image. Uh, and that is why we have a unique relationship with God that no other creature on earth has. Moreover, this verse provides a foundation for the biblical understanding of God's relationship with humanity. It tells us that God is the author of life. He is the giver of every good gift. It tells us that God is the author uh, of life. Uh, it emphasizes that uh, of all of creation, that all of creation is subject to God's will and that he has a purpose for everything that he has made. This purpose is further revealed throughout the rest of the Bible. God's work to bring about his plan of redemption through his son, through the person of Jesus Christ. The importance of Genesis 1-1 can also be seen in the way it is echoed and amplified throughout the rest of Scripture. For example, the Gospel of John begins with the same words, in the beginning, which connects the creation account in Genesis to the person of Jesus Christ. John's Gospel reveals that Jesus was present at the beginning. He was there at creation, and, it, and that he is the source, actually, of creation. And creation uh, was created for him. He is the source of all life. He is the source of all light. Likewise, other passages in the New Testament, such as Colossians 1, 16-17, reinforce the importance of Genesis 1-1, emphasizing that everything was created through Christ and it was for Christ. This shows us that the story of creation is not simply a historical account, but it is part of God's ongoing plan of redemption. Genesis 1-1 is a foundational verse that reminds us of God's sovereignty over all creation, his desire to be in relationship with all humanity. It establishes the foundation for the biblical message, again, of redemption and restoration. It points to the person of Jesus Christ, who is the creator and sustainer of all things. The first phrase, in the beginning, refers to the start of time itself. Prior to this moment, there was no such thing as time. There was no such thing as space. There was no such thing as matter. In other words, God created everything, absolutely everything, from absolutely nothing. There was no Big Bang other than God's words being spoken. Second phrase, God created the heavens and the earth, speaks to the creation of matter and of space. The term heavens refers to the vast expanse of space, while the term earth refers to the physical matter that was created. This includes everything we can see, that we can touch. It's everything from the stars that we can see in the night sky to the ground beneath our feet. It's important to note that Genesis 1-1 does not provide a detailed scientific explanation of how God created matter, space, and time that was not Moses' goal. Instead, it was a statement to affirm the glory, to affirm the power of the one true God, the one true God of the Israelites. It speaks to the fact that God is the originator of the universe, that everything that exists was brought into being by His creative power. He is a creator. That is what he does. Two words used most for God in the Old Testament is Elohim and Yahweh. The name Yahweh is one of the most significant and sacred names of God in the Bible. It appears over 6,800 times throughout the Old Testament. It is first introduced in Genesis 2-4 where it is used to describe God in his personal relationship with Adam and Eve. In Genesis 1-1, however, the name Yahweh is not used. Instead, the name Elohim is used. It's used there to emphasize God's power and his sovereignty as the creator. The, not, the name Yahweh is a powerful and sacred name of God, but it emphasizes his personal relationship with people. It also emphasizes his faithfulness to his promises so throughout the Bible, this name is used, Yahweh is used, to describe God's character and actions, highlighting his love, his compassion, his sovereignty as the one true God. 
So why uh, wasn't Yahweh used in Genesis 1.1? Yahweh again emphasizes God's personal relationship with people, his covenantal faithfulness. Elohim, however, emphasizes God's power and sovereignty as the creator of the universe. As such, Elohim is often used in passages that describes God's role as a judge, as a ruler, um, and as the creator. So Yahweh is used more often in passages that describes God's personal interaction with people. The greater reason that I appreciate that Elohim was used um, is that the word Elohim, it is a plural noun. Bara sit, bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. Actually, it's put, in the beginning, created God uh, in the order of Hebrew. Um, but the importance of Elohim being plural is that this reflects the idea that God is a triune God from the very beginning. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. Why would Moses write that Yahweh is one? Certain people would argue, oh, he was saying that he's, he's not one amongst other gods, but he is the God, right? He is one. I do not believe that's what Moses was writing about in Deuteronomy. I th believe that Moses had the understanding, of course, of Father, of Son, and of Holy Spirit. He understood that God was not just one person, so to speak, but that he was three. God is made up, of course, of three persons. Some scholars believe that the plural form of Elohim reflects the early Hebrew concept of a divine council, however, in which they believe God presides over a group of angelic beings who carry out his will. Others suggest that the plural form may be a way of emphasizing God's power and his majesty. Simply, or similar to the use of royal we, when they would say we in English. Still others argue that the plural form is simply a grammatical co uh, convention of the Hebrew language. It does not carry any special theological meaning. That's what some of these scholars would say. We know that all of these are incorrect. Because the reason that this word is used is why, it is a, it's, why it's a plural noun is because God wanted us to understand the, from the very first words of the Bible that he gave to us, that Moses wrote down that he is God, a God that is made up of multiple persons. The one true God, no, there is no other God, um, but that he is made up of a Godhead, the triune God. And that is shown throughout the Old Testament and on into the New. He is still one. Just as water takes the form of a liquid and of a solid and of gas, God is all three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God creates with intention, and he creates with order. Genesis 1-2 shows us that God, or that uh, before God began his creative work, the earth was formless. It was void. Through his intentional and orderly creative process, God brought order and beauty out of that chaos, out of emptiness. This reminds us that God is not a random or capricious creator, rather a purposeful and deliberate one. He, he wants to bring meaning. He wants to bring about a purpose, not only in creation, which is what he did, but in our lives as well. Genesis 1-2 begins with a description of the state of the earth before God began his creative work. We read, the earth was without form and it was void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. This description paints us a picture. It's of chaos, of disorder, and of absolute darkness. However, this chaos was not an accident. It was not by random occurrence. It was a necessary step in God's intentional and orderly plan for creation. We see that God's intentional and meth meth methodically, I don't know why I wrote that word down. That's all right. Anyway, we see that God's intentional, uh, intention began to bring order into chaos. In Genesis 1-3 we read, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. This reveals that God spoke with intention. He spoke with purpose. He brought light into darkness, beginning the process of creating order out of 
chaos. As we continue to read through the rest of just Genesis chapter 1, we see that God's creative work follows an intentional and orderly progression. God separates water. He creates sky. He creates dry land. He brings forth vegetation. He brings forth living creatures. Each step in this process is intentional. It's purposeful. It demonstrates God's sovereignty over creation and His plan to bring order to chaos. The intention, intentional um, and orderly... Uh, my touch screen's not working, so I have to do it manually. Uh, intentionally and orderly work of God in creation leads us to ask the question, what is the ultimate purpose of all things? We find the answer in Genesis 1.31, which says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The purpose of creation is to reflect the goodness and the glory of God himself to provide a home for the humans which he loves so much and to invite us to live in harmony with the natural world. Genesis 1-2, the state of the earth is described as formless. It's described as empty, void, without form. The Hebrew word here, uh, words I should say, used here, is tohu vabohu. It means chaos, absolute chaos. No order. It means completely empty. The earth was in a state of disorder. It was in a state of confusion without any structure, without any form. Despite the chaos, God saw creative potential in the void and the chaos which was the earth and the universe. In fact, the very next verse describes how God began to bring order out of the chaos by speaking, of course, into creation. The power of God's word and his creative potential transformed this formless void into a magnificent universe. The concept of God bringing order out of chaos is a reoccurring theme that we find throughout the entire Bible. Psalms 104 verse 30 says, When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. This verse suggests that God's creative potential is not limited by the chaos or disorder. Rather, he can bring life and beauty out of what seems to be absolutely nothing. From a theological perspective, the idea of God bringing order out of chaos reveals his power and sovereignty in all things. It also demonstrates his creative nature and his ability to transform what seems to be hopeless or impossible into something new, to something beautiful, something that has hope. This concept can be applied as well to our lives, which is what I love the most about it. Just as God brought order and chaos into creation, into the in complete and uh, absolute universe, he can also bring order and, uh, and purpose to our lives. But that only happens when we surrender to him and his will. When we feel lost, when we feel confused, we can trust that God has the power to bring order and to bring meaning into our lives, just as he did with the formless void of Genesis 1-2. And I think that's one of the most powerful things, that God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so the formless void that you think your life might be, God can create purpose and meaning and make you beautiful from the inside out, so to speak. You are not without hope. God's creation reveals his character and his glory Throughout the creation account in Genesis 1, we see glimpse of, glimpses of God's character. We see glimpses of his glory. For example, we see how his power and sovereignty and his ability to speak the universe into being. His goodness is declaring everything that he has made to be good. His creative and attention to detail uh, in crafting each aspect of the world uh, is absolutely amazing when you consider really how the how the universe operates. 
as we marvel at the beauty and the complexity of our creation that we get to live in, we are reminded of the greatness and goodness of God. We are invited to worship Him with absolute awe, with absolute reverence. The idea that God, that His creation reveals His character and glory, it's a central theme that we find throughout the Bible. It's a concept that He has profound implications for our understanding of who He is and how we are to live in our relationship with Him. From the opening pages of Scripture, we see that God's creation is a reflection of His power. It's a reflection of His wisdom, of His love. In Genesis 1, we read that God spoke the world into existence, which calls forth this light, the land, the sea, the sky, from this formless void. The Bible teaches us that God's creation, from the smallest creatures to the vastness of the universe, it displays His power, displays His wisdom, and it displays His love for humanity. Each day He created new forms of life, culminating in the creation of humanity, whom He would make in His own image. As we observe the beauty and complexity of creation, we can see the evidence of God's creative and His creativity and His intelligence. The intricacy of a flower, the majesty of a mountain range, the diversity of the animal kingdom, all of these point to the greatness of our Creator. The Apostle Paul echoes this idea in Romans 1.20 where he states, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, both His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. This verse suggests that God's creation, it's a visible testimony of His divine nature. It's there to reveal to us His character and His attributes. Moreover, the Bible teaches that creation is not just a display of God's power. It also is a a revelation, of course, of His character. Psalms 19, the psalmist writes, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Creation is not just a static display. It's a dynamic proclamation of who God is. The beauty and intricacy of creation, it points to God's creativity and the order to which He designed all of creation. And all of these things, they point to His wisdom and His intelligence. Job Job 12, 7 through 10, Job declares that even the animals and the bird They testify to God's handiwork. They demonstrate His sovereignty over all creation. When we look at the beauty of a sunset or the vastness of the universe, we are reminded of God's greatness and His power. When we witness the miracle of birth or the intricate working of the human body, we are reminded of His endless wisdom. When we see that diversity of the natural world or the complexity of the human community. We are reminded of His love and His creativity. The Bible teaches that humanity is uniquely created in the image of God. This means that we are to bear the stamp of His character. We are to bear the stamp of His attributes. That we are called to reflect God's glory. We are to do so in the world in which we are, have been placed, in which we live. We are called to love as He loves, to create as He creates, to serve as He serves. As we embrace our identity as image bearers of God, we are called to be stewards of His creation, to live in harmony with His purposes. We are called to care for the earth and all its inhabitants, recognizing that they are precious in His sight. We are called to work for justice, to work for peace, knowing that these are the values of the kingdom of God. As we contemplate the beauty, the wonder of this natural world which God has given us to live in, we are reminded of God's greatness, His power, His kindness, His love, even His justice. As we embrace our identity as image bearers of God, <coughs> excuse me, we are called to be stewards of, <coughs> excuse me, 
stewards of his creation, to live in harmony with his purposes. As we observe the beauty and wonder of creation, we can be reminded of the greatness of God and his love towards us. We should also be inspired to reflect his character and attributes in our own lives, bringing glory and honor to him in all that we do. May we always seek to honor and glorify uh, him in all that we do, knowing that he is the creator and sustainer of absolutely all things. And in that we can have hope, uh, knowing that he is he's the one still creating, creating in us the capacity to do what he's called us to do, creating uh, the capacity in us to serve him in the way that he's called us to serve him, and to go through the things that he has called us to go through, many of which, uh, many of which things are not easy to go through. But just as God took a formless, void, chaotic mess, he can also do so with you. Because I don't know about you, but much of my life is chaos and empty, especially when I'm not with God, when I'm not following what he's called me to do, when I'm not adhering to his word. The more time I spend with God, the more my life has meaning, has purpose, that it's not formless and void or darkness, but it is light, it is orderly, and it is profound. I remember uh, getting home from work. I used to work, when I worked at Pizza Supreme in Bradalbin, <clears throat> I would stay at the pizza place rather late and uh, working with Frank and Tone, who were great. Uh, I would, uh, I'd be talking with them, you know, until sometimes 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And then uh, I'd, I'd get home, you know, and I remember getting home one night, and I don't remember why, but I remember uh, getting home and everything was dark, and I looked up in the night sky, and I just saw, I remember seeing the stars and how far away the stars were, and I was just thinking, how tiny am I? And I'm a rather large individual. I like to eat. Um, but I just remember thinking how vast the universe is. But even smaller than that, if you just take the size of the earth, which we live on, and how small I am compared to the size of the earth. And then you consider the universe. And think of the glory of God, and yet he set aside time, his love, just so he could spend time and his love on you. God is not in our creation in the way that he is confined to the laws of which we are confined to. He's outside of creation, so he's not in time. So one of the things I think is beautiful is that since God is not in time, he can enter time anytime he wants to. And I believe that for an eternity, God looked inside the box of his creation. He pulled out a picture of you. And he said, wow, I love you. My creation is perfect. Look at what I made. And so when he, he stops and looks at you all of the time, and I think for an eternity he has stared at you and said, wow, I love you. I have a purpose for you. I have meaning for you. Don't you want to just spend time with me? And then he put you back in the box. And then he went to the next day and he pulled you out again and just stared at you for an eternity because he loves you. Amy bought me a picture <clears throat> for Father's Day, I believe it was, a couple years ago. And it's, it's several pictures. It's a collage. And uh, it's me holding the babies, my babies. Uh, I need a new one because... You know, I have another one now, but there's only the two oldest ones. Um, and I love staring at the picture. Not at me. Uh, she could have left me out of that, those pictures. But I love staring at my kids. And so that's what I picture when God takes a picture of you out of time. And he just stares at you, saying, wow, I love you. And that's what I do with when I look at my kids. Wow, I love them. And so know that there is order there is a purpose, there is meaning for your life. That God still has a reason for you to live. A reason for you to spend time with him. There's hope. That's what Palm Sunday was all about. Was the hope was finally coming to do what he was sent to do and to die a miserable, awful, excruciating death 
for one reason and one reason only. Really two reasons. To glorify God, his Father, but to create a way for us to have a relationship with God from formless, void, evil human beings to then seen as righteous, the righteousness of Christ, that we would be able to have a relationship with our Lord and, Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for Genesis. Thank you for creating in us a capacity, Father, that is not um, void, but that we have hope, Father. And thank you that you came into our lives, saved our souls, created a way for us to have a relationship with you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that Christ came and that he did die for us, Father. Help us as we go through Genesis to consider who you are, to consider your power, your majesty, to consider how much you love us. Father, thank you for allowing Moses to write these words down for us that we would be able to glean from them and learn from them. Help us to not take them for granted, Lord. Help us not take your words for granted. Let us be in your word each and every day, Father God, as often as we possibly can. Help us to be lovers of your word, for it is the power of your word that literally spoke everything into existence. Father, we want to be a people that serves you and loves you, that do everything according to your plan. Help us to lay aside our lives, understanding that we are slaves for your gospel. Lord, if there is anyone here today that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I ask that you would touch their hearts this morning. You would touch them in such a mighty way that they would need to know who you are, that they would want to change their lives for the better knowing that the creator of the universe still has a reason and a purpose for their lives, that he wants to bring order, that you want to bring order unto them, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this little church in Gloversville, New York. Thank you that you are here and that you are doing such a mighty work. Lord, continue to sustain us and be our provision each and every day. Help us to focus on your will and not our own. So we love you, we thank you, Bless our time together, Father God, especially our fellowship after. Let our conversation be of speaking of you and your greatness and not of anything else. So thank you. We praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.